couple other things to worry about when you're taking a survey. You have to worry about something called non-response bias. Okay. This is when people who you've sent the survey to, you've picked your sample, don't respond to you. They don't send back their forms. They, they hang up the phone. They refuse to interview with you. Okay. If the people who don't respond are very different than the people who do respond, well, if you're just going to analyze those respondents, you're going to get inaccurate answers. For example, let's say you survey people about income, all right? And people who make very high incomes don't want to respond to you because they don't want you to know they make very high incomes. Well, if you use the sample that you have to estimate, say, the average income, you're going to be missing all the high income people. You're going to be too low with your average, okay? Non-response bias is a big problem in any major survey. It's something to watch out for whenever you uh, read about a survey. Another thing to worry about is something called frame coverage bias. Okay? And the idea here is, remember in, that, in that, that second step, we had to make a list of every single person, every single unit in the population. Well, if our list doesn't cover the whole population, then we're not going to be picking a sample that's representative. Okay? That's a frame coverage. A frame is the list. That's what it's called. That's a frame coverage bias. We don't want that to happen either. Well, let's see some examples of these types of things in action. Here's an example uh, that was broadcast on Nightline, which is Ted Koppel's show. And what Koppel asked, uh, he asked people to, to call in his show and give their opinion on whether the United Nations should, be, uh, should continue to have its operations in New York, where it currently is. Okay. Well, it turns out that he called, uh, about 186,000 people called in. Okay. Big, big number. And 67% of them said no. So you might think, wow, that's an overwhelming uh, percentage that don't want the UN to move. But remember, this is voluntary response. Okay. The people who called in have really strong opinions on it. In fact, a separate, independent, random sample, right, the good type of sample, was taken. And actually, 72% of people said, yes, the UN should stay in. So there's an example of voluntary response not working. Another example. This was a poll that was done by Literary Digest in 1936. And they actually called the election wrong. What they did was they mailed out questionnaires to 10 million people. It's a big, again, big, big number. Asking them to uh, send back who they would vote for, Alf Landon or Franco Delano Roosevelt. And the folks who they mailed it to were selected off of lists of telephone books and club memberships, okay? And it turns out that about 2.4 million people actually responded, right? Well, 2.4 million sounds like a lot of people, okay? But those 2.4 million people are, again, going to be people who have really strong opinions about this election and want their opinions to be known. Okay, so you can have non-response bias there. And you also have the potential for frame coverage bias, right? Because we're mailing this questionnaire out to people who were selected off telephone books, lists, and club memberships. Well, back in 1936, not everybody had telephones. Okay, only the upper class of folks had telephones. So really, they were mailing questionnaires to the upper class people. Okay? So what did the Literary Digest find? Well, they found that 57% of the people would vote for Alf Landon, okay? And 43% of the people would vote for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Okay? Well, in the actual election, what happened was 38% of the people voted for Landon, and FDR got 62% of the vote, won by a landslide, okay? You can see that this frame coverage bias and non-response bias had a huge effect. The Digest poll was way off, okay? Here's a third example of a problematic survey. This is a book written by uh, Cher Height. She wrote this book called Women in Love, A Cultural Revolution in Progress in 1987. It had some really startling conclusions. One of the things that Height found was that 84% of women were, quote, not satisfied emotionally with their relationships. Okay, that's, that's a pretty big percentage, right? And 95% of women report forms of emotional and psychological harassment from men. With, in, with whom they have loving relationships. 95%, right? That's pretty scary, okay? 
70% of women married five or more years are having sex outside their marriages. Okay? This is a cultural revolution in progress, these kind of numbers. Well, let's figure out how Cher Height did the survey. First thing she did was she sent 100,000 questionnaires to professional women's groups, to counseling centers, church societies, senior citizen centers. Okay? Clearly, that is not a representative group of, of the population of women. In fact, those women are more likely to, perhaps more likely to respond yes to some of these questions. Second, what did the survey actually look like? Well, it had 127 essay questions, right? Who the heck's going to fill out 127 essay questions? Only 4.5% of people actually did that. So you have a massive, massive non-response bias because the people who actually are willing to take the time to fill out 127 Questionnaires are only people who have really strong opinions. Okay? So that's why we see uh, these, these really scary numbers that were in uh, Cher Height's book. Okay? Big non-response bias. It's really important whenever you're looking at a survey, or reading about a survey, or designing your own, to think about taking random samples and worry about uh, non-response bias, to worry about frame coverage bias, all those sorts of things. Okay? And that's a survey. 